Thank you everybody for joining us today. We've got a very interesting webcast for you, and I hope you enjoy it. A uh, quick little agenda for today. Uh, we did uh, already talk about the way that you can get questions to us. Um, that will be through the chat function on the left-hand side, I believe it is, of your screen. Uh, love to get a vibrant Q&A going here. We're going to hold all the questions until the very end. Uh, that way we can make sure we have a chance to eliminate any duplicate questions that are coming up. If there is something that is urgent, uh, we will be able to get messages to our uh, presenters. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we will be tweeting about this, and we'd love to have you join us online. It's going to be hashtag visible five ways. So if you have any uh, comments, any thoughts, anything, please join us in that conversation online. So after our introductions and a very brief poll, what we'll do is we'll turn it over to Forrester. And with Forrester, they're going to be talking about the five ways that smart marketers can use social data analytics. And they'll also be giving examples of each one of those, which is great. After uh, moving through those five, we'll hand it over to uh, Ken with Visible Technologies. And Ken will walk us through some of the visible stories, but more importantly, we'll talk about how you can get started. It doesn't really matter what platform you're using. Um, there's a way to get started in being a smarter marketer with social data analytics. And Ken will walk us through some of that. And then finally, we'll go through some Q&A and some wrap-up. So our presenters today, we're very lucky to have a couple of people. Um, the first person we have here is Nate Elliott, and he's a VP with Forrester Research. And he really focuses on working with marketing executives and marketing leadership to help them take advantage of digital channels. Um, if you've been to a, you know, a couple of uh, big events in the industry, South by Southwest, uh, or to ad tech, you maybe have seen Nate speaking at some of those. Uh, if you're a uh, frequent reader of The Economist or the New York Times business section or the Wall Street Journal, you may have also seen him there. So widely published, uh, a real authority in how digital marketing uh, works most effectively and also how social media is kind of evolving within that space. And then next we have Ken Giffen who is the VP of Marketing at Visible Technologies. And Ken has been working in marketing for the last 20 years across a, a multitude of functional areas including PR, communications, brand management, demand generation. Worked with some of the really big names in, in all kinds of different in industries, General Electric, Amex, Norelco. Uh, and he's got a ton of experience in applying uh, these types of things to marketing. And uh, I think he'll be a great source of information for everybody. So before we before we dive into this, one thing that we really like to do at the very beginning is just get a feel for the sense of the audience that we have on today. Um, we had a lot of people uh, register for this. So please just take a couple of minutes here to give us a sense of where you are in your social media analytics skills. Are you just getting started? Meaning maybe you're looking to develop a roadmap. Maybe you're developing the business case for it. Maybe you're using something very, very simple like Google Alerts, right? But uh, you're in the early stages of trying to figure out how to use social media analytics. Are you advancing? You know, so you're kind of looking for where do I go next after I've got the basics under my belt? We know some things about sentiment. We know some things about volumes and different media channels and things like that. But what do we do next? And then finally would be the ninjas. You know, the ninjas are the ones that are doing a lot right now, lots of predictive analytics and things like that with social media. Um, social media analytics is an enterprise-wide play for the ninja, right? Um, everybody in the company has bought into it, and everybody's using it uh, for all kinds of different purposes. But uh, did want to try to get a little bit of feedback. So we do have a few people out there that are ninjas. I think those advanced um, people, and we'll have a little bit of content for you too. So I think you'll enjoy it. But pretty evenly distributed across getting started and advancing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show how the poll is working its way out. I think that gives us a pretty good idea of where people are. So thank you very much for that. Without any further ado, what I'm going to do is hand it over to Nate. And Nate's going to walk us through the five ways smart marketers can start using social data analytics. Nate, uh, the presentation is yours. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, and, uh, and good day to everyone. Thanks uh, for joining us today. I'm, I'm really pleased to have a chance to speak with you about uh, some of our research on um, how marketers can take advantage of, uh, of social data and, uh, and use it more uh, effectively. 
So um, when, we, uh, when we talk about uh, social data at, at Forrester, this is something we think uh, every marketer should be taking advantage of. Um, there is so much opportunity. There are so many great ways that companies can uh, get value from listening, uh, social intelligence, and all the other data that's available to them through the social web. And, and I want to talk you through uh, those five different ways in, in just a minute. Um, but let me actually start by, by um, uh, pointing something out, which is we think that too many marketers are missing this social data opportunity. I, I don't talk to many marketers who, who doubt that there's opportunity uh, in using data and information from social media to improve their marketing plans. And, and we're talking about both their social marketing plans, but also their broader marketing plans. But um, when we run surveys and we have conversations with marketers, we find that too few marketers don't have direct access to social data. So more and more companies are engaging with social listening and social intelligence companies. Um, but what we find is for the most part, um, the people who have access to these tools are maybe in the customer intelligence team. Maybe they're in the market research team. Very important for those guys to have access to social data, but what we'd like to see is for more marketers to get their hands directly on some of the social information um, so that they can better take advantage of some of the five ways that social data can improve your marketing that we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, we also are a little concerned by the fact that agencies aren't necessarily uh, using social data as well as they could. So we talked to lots of marketers who say, our agency does listening on our behalf but we very rarely see that information. Um, uh, in, in some cases, we even hear about uh, uh, marketers working with multiple agencies and the agency that runs the social listening for that marketer, uh, in some cases, refuses to share access to that data with the other agencies that are working with the marketer, which is a worst case scenario. This stuff is incredibly powerful. It can do wonders for improving your marketing programs in a lot of different ways. And what we'd love to see is for more marketers to get their hands directly on social data, but also for the agencies, um, not just the social agency, not just the digital agency, but for all the agencies that work with a marketer to have access to this data as well because there are so many really good ways that social data can improve um, uh, your marketing program. So um, we're going to go through these five ways marketers should use social data. Um, just to give them to you up front before we run through them one by one, uh, number one, we think that uh, marketers can use social data to develop messaging and content. Number two, we think it's a great way to source and refine creative. Number three, um, we uh, love what it can do to help marketers improve their media plans. Number four, we think it's a wonderful way to identify key influencers and create word of mouth. And number five, we think it's uh, incredibly valuable for reacting to real-time opportunities and also to real-time threats as well. But uh, as I promised, let me walk through those one by one. And, and I'll start with this, this first point, which is um, we can use social data to develop messaging and content as well. Um, tapping into the conversations our audiences are having uh, to understand what's important to them, what's relevant to them, and, uh, and maybe what questions they're asking is a great way to figure out what messages we should be delivering and to, uh, to uh, inspire our own marketing team when they set to work in creating content. Um, one really a good example of that that, um, that we've seen is something that uh, UPS did to understand um, how its customers um, were uh, trying to make use of its services so that they could put the right kind of content into, uh, um, into uh, uh, digital channels. So for instance, um, UPS used uh, social listening and social intelligence to pay attention to the challenges that small businesses had, um, both their general business challenges, but also the business challenges they were uh, facing when they tried to work with UPS. And that allowed them to, uh, to build content, in this case YouTube videos, that help people solve those challenges. So they found, for instance, that lots of their small business customers um, just didn't understand how to work uh, uh, the delivery uh, uh, confirmation tracking and notification systems that UPS has to offer. Um, they made uh, a YouTube video just a couple minutes long to show them how they would go about doing it. And by listening to their audience's challenges, they were able to create content that really resonated uh, with uh, those audiences. And so uh, the, the videos they made that were based upon the topics they identified from social listening uh, got engagement rates I think six times higher than the videos that they've been producing that didn't rely upon social listening uh, as one of the key data inputs. 
Um, we also see that there are some more fun ways that brands can take advantage of social listening. So uh, Dolby Laboratories uh, does this in a, a really interesting way. Um, Dolby wants to stay top of mind with folks who uh, might be interested in high-end uh, um, uh, speakers and, and high-end sound. Uh, and so it's looking for conversations to which it is relevant. It turns out Dolby has been around for decades now and has worked on lots of really popular uh, entertainment properties. It's uh, got a lot of fun facts. And, and Dolby and its agency have collected some of those fun facts. And what they do is they actually pay attention for when the topics related to their fun facts are trending. So it seems like every week now there's um, there's a, uh, a new uh, rumor or release about what's happening with the new Star Wars movies. Well, one of Dolby's fun facts is that they actually um, uh, worked with Star Wars. It was the first ever uh, film presented in Dolby Stereo, and it won the best Oscar, uh, the, the Oscar for uh, best sound back in 1978. Um, this is one of the hashtag Dolby facts that they use. And, and again, it's because they're paying attention to which topics are trending in social media that they can put this information out there, um, get it in front of the right audience, and, and offer uh, users in social media um, content and messages um, that are going to resonate with the things that they're already talking about. So um, that's number one. Social data can help us uh, uh, develop messaging and content as well. Um, but it can also help us source and refine our own creative. And, and I really like this because you know, if point one is about how we learn from social data so that when we build creative, it's more effective, number two is actually just going straight to the source and, and asking our customers in many cases um, if they can uh, uh, help us um, uh, either offer us creative that we can use or uh, give us insights on exactly which creative are, are going to uh, work best for them. So one of my favorite examples of this right now is what's happening uh, with REI, the um, outdoor equipment retailer, and their Instagram program. Um, they've done a great job in the last uh, 18 months or so of, of running a program called the REI 1440 Project. And 1440 is actually the number of minutes in a day. And, and the message behind the 1440 Project is that you should spend as many of those minutes as possible outside. And of course, um, it gives you access to beautiful views like the one in the image that you see on your screen right now. And um, uh, it uh, perhaps follows that if you spend more time outside, you're going to buy more stuff from REI. Um, but REI is doing a really good job of actually um, not taking responsibility for creating all the imagery they post on Instagram themselves. In fact, the vast majority of what REI posts on Instagram is coming from their own Instagram followers, from their own audience. So you can actually see um, that uh, there's a photo credit on the image on the screen right now. It's because REI didn't create this image. One of their followers did. And it's an absolutely stunning image. It stands for everything um, that uh, REI wants to stand for. The interaction rates are incredible on this stuff. Um, you can see more than 10,000 likes on this post in, in just the course of a few days. Um, and uh, consistently REI finds that turning to its audience to create images works really well. Um, it, it even in many cases works better than uh, when you create images yourself as a marketer. So another Instagram example that I like is Ford. Ford does a lot of fun stuff. And I always assume that their Mustang Mondays um, would perform really well because Ford's got so many beauty shots of classic Mustangs. And people do interact with the Mustang Monday photos, but it turns out they're even more likely to interact with um, photos that are posted by consumers. Um, even if those photos are of less sexy models. So images of, uh, of uh, Ford Escapes, for instance, um, doesn't sound that interesting. It's you know, just a, a run-of-the-mill SUV, uh, you would say. Um, it's certainly not sexy like a muscle car, like a Mustang, um, but it's those user-generated gener images of perhaps the, the, the uh, um, less notable uh, brands within Ford um, that often do really well. So um, that's one example. Um, the other example we have for this um, I, I am in love with. Um, Foot Locker has this program called Sneakerpedia. If you don't know it, you should go and check it out after the webinar. But what they're doing is actually um, offering people who love sneakers, who collect sneakers, uh, a place where they can go and talk about their sneaker fetish, if you will. Um, these folks are so interested in, in, uh, in collecting sneakers, they, they want to show off their collections. They want to share the collections with others around them. They want to comment on, uh, on the shoes others have, have chosen to add to their collection. It's a wonderful resource if you're one of these uh, people called sneaker heads uh, who, uh, uh, who own maybe hundreds of pairs of shoes. Um, well, it turns out that in addition to being a great place for Foot Locker to engage with this audience, they're learning a lot from this. And so they now know, because of their users on Sneakerpedia, uh, what colors and brands and styles of sneakers are the most popular in which of their markets. And that means if you see yellow Pumas 
in a footlocker circular, or circular in Chicago, there's a chance that those yellow Pumas were put there because that's the kind of shoe that Chicago-based Sneakerpedia users um, are engaging with right now. Or if you walk by a Foot Locker store window in Miami and you see a lot of Nikes, it's probably because the Foot Locker uh, Sneakerpedia users in Miami uh, are liking Nikes more than the other brands right now. A fantastic example of tapping into social data to source and refine creative. When we look at the third thing that social can do um, to, uh, um, to improve your, your marketing, um, we really like this idea of using social to improve your media plan. And this is something even the social networks themselves are getting in on. So um, Twitter is now offering marketers the ability to, t to promote tweets to users who are engaging with the TV shows in which those advertisers have placed spots. So let me explain that to make sure it makes sense. If you are, say, Holiday Inn Express, and you are advertising in uh, Mad Men, um, Twitter is going to allow you to actually go and find the people who are talking about Mad Men on Twitter and promote your tweet to that audience. So now you are actually uh, targeting specifically the people who are likely to have seen your TV spot on the air with a secondary message through digital channels. A great example of using social intelligence and social listening um, to, uh, uh, to uh, help uh, this marketer refine their, uh, their media plan and, and make sure they are buying ads against the right audience. And, and what Twitter says is when they use this, um, their uh, brands are seeing 27% higher engagement per tweet than when they are not using this form of, uh, of TV-based targeting. Um, there are simpler ways of taking advantage of this as well. And, and one of the things that Microsoft found was that people were having conversations about the Mac versus PC debate in some pretty unusual places. When they tuned into their social intelligence tools, they uh, uh, found out, for instance, that uh, in a UK-based uh, motoring website called Piston Heads, uh, people were having these uh, sort of ongoing uh, and uh, very passionate debates about whether Macintosh or, or Microsoft-based PCs were better computers. Now there's no good reason that this would exist in an automotive website, um, but sure enough, that's where this great conversation was taking place. Microsoft was therefore able to add to its media buy uh, banners on this website. Um, likewise, they found lots of other opportunities where um, people were talking about uh, Macs and PCs and, and were able to add those to their media plans as well. So um, that's the third way that social data can help by improving your media plan. The fourth way is by identifying key influencers. And uh, of course we've all seen examples of this here, but um, this can be just a small handful of key influencers. And uh, Mercedes is running a, a great program where they've identified uh, six uh, really popular and, uh, and well-followed Instagram photographers. Um, and, uh, and they've given them all a, a version of their new $30,000 model um, to drive around for a week, uh, take pictures, and whoever gets the most likes and shares of their uh, Mercedes-based posts over the course of the week actually gets to keep the car. Now they were able to identify um, who they should uh, pick, not just based upon um, uh, the uh, total influence or follower base of this audience, but based upon the types of images and information they were posting as well, something that social intelligence can do for you. If you want to make it much broader and reach out to a big audience, um, you can use social listening for that as well. Uh, and Bomgar is a B2B uh, software company, um, and they wanted to make sure people were talking about them in social media, so they wanted to find some advocates. And, and um, uh, once again, they turned to social listening. They were trying to find people not just who were existing customers and passionate about the products that they offered. They wanted to find people who were actively talking about those products as well. They now have hundreds of influencers in this uh, Bomgar Insider program, and it was social listening that allowed them to identify many of those influencers. Fifth and, and finally, we think that social data is a great way um, to, or a great tool for helping you react to real-time opportunities and to real-time threats as well. Uh, and uh, Unilever has a big one of these because if you know Unilever, you know that they make some really popular margarine brands like Flora. But there's a persistent rumor online that margarine is, uh, uh, is uh, actually very chemically close in nature to plastic. Uh, it's uh, one of those things that sounds uh, just possible enough, uh, just likely enough that, um, um, that people want to believe it, but in fact it's uh, not even a little bit true. But it's a big misperception, and, and Unilever uses social 
listening to identify conversations online where people are propagating this myth and then helps get them to the actual scientific facts about uh, margarine and, uh, and uh, how it is for your health. You can see on the screen a page on their website they often direct people to, but it's through social listening that they can identify those real-time threats and take advantage of them. Of course, there are some opportunities you can take advantage of as well. And I'll finish up today with, uh, with a company that didn't manage to take advantage of an opportunity, and I really wish they had. Um, at the British Royal Wedding a couple of years ago, we all remember uh, that uh, Prince William and, uh, and Kate both looked very good in their formal wedding attire. Uh, but one of the things that uh, Regain, um, which is the, the UK version of Rogaine, um, it's the same brand with a slightly different brand name, country to country. Regain actually um, uh, and their listening partner identified that uh, one of the things that was trending uh, during the royal wedding were comments about Prince William's bald spot. And uh, if you look closely at the image on the screen right now, you can uh, see uh, just a, a little uh, too little hair uh, on uh, the crown of his head. Uh, now, um, it turns out that Regain was not prepared to respond quickly enough to get approved content online uh, about the royal wedding. And you know, just imagine how uh, wonderfully effective a, a simple uh, photo of the couple from behind with a uh, congratulations uh, uh, Will and Kate and a Regain logo would have been. Uh, it would have been the uh, royal wedding version of uh, the Oreo Dunk in the Dark program, I think. Um, as I said, unfortunately, they, they weren't prepared. They were listening and they identified the opportunity, but they weren't ready to take advantage of that opportunity. But make sure that that doesn't happen to you. And when you're listening, um, find those opportunities and, and make sure you can take advantage of those opportunities as well. So again, there are all these great ways that marketers can take advantage of social data by developing and messaging content, by sourcing and refining creative, improving your media plan, identifying key influencers, and reacting, hopefully, to real-time opportunities and threats as well. Um, that's why we talk to every marketer about the importance of listening and using social to improve not just their social programs, but using social data to improve their overall marketing programs. So with that, let me turn it back over to Rich. Great. Thanks, Nate. I want to plug a little reminder here. Remember, uh, for some of the people that maybe came on a little bit late, uh, if you do have a question for Nate or for Ken, please use the chat functionality within your, uh, your webcast panel. So we have one more question here that we wanted to ask everybody. Um, after getting that review, the five things that smart marketers could be using social media analytics for, what is uh, on your list now for the next 12 months? Right? If you had a, a genie come out of the bottle and say, uh, I'm sure you've got good things that you could spend the first two on, but your third one would be, my company would be able to work more like UPS and Dolby using social media data for better targeting. REI and Foot Locker using it to source creative. Holiday Inn and Microsoft uh, impacting and improving media plans. Mercedes and Baumgar, really focusing in on the influencers and helping to manage those influencers. And then finally, Unilever, and the opposite of Unilever was uh, Regain, but being able to react quickly to things that are going on in the market near real time. Which one would be your top uh, priority over the next 12 months? So we can see uh, some of the things that are coming in now. The front runner there is being able to manage influencers. Uh, numbers kind of bouncing around pretty quickly, but managing influencers, impacting media plans, both very tangible. And then better targeting and developing messaging is another real key one too. So uh, thank you very much for that. Now what I want to do is I want to hand it over to Ken. And what Ken is going to do is he is going to walk us through the real-world application of this, uh, of these five things, and how uh, marketers, communications people, social media people can get started right away. Ken? Great. Thank you, Rich. And, and thank you, Nate, for those great examples. Um, you know, personally, I loved the example of Foot Locker, loved the example of Mercedes, and I think those are all, along others, really inspirational things to get your creative juices going and think how you could really apply. And what I wanted to do is just wrap up the webinar today and put on a practical marketing hat. So if we have all the inspirational stories that we've listened to with Forrester, you know, the next question would be, what could I do right now back in the office today to make this work for my company or my brand? And so I have three simple pieces of advice uh, just to wrap up the webcast. 
the first piece of advice is just making sure that you have the right approach or the right mindset with social intelligence. And this might seem like simple common sense, but I think it is really important to remember that social media sometimes seems like a shiny object in the corner, and people tend to get wrapped up in the volumes and the high-level stats and thinking that it's a silo or something that needs to be treated separately. And our clients really understand that that's not the right approach for social. The better approach for social is thinking about what is a business challenge or a marketing challenge that you're facing today, and then how do I apply social intelligence to that? And every single example I think that Nate gave actually followed that path, which was there was a challenge, and then how do we actually make social work for us? And so first piece of advice is simply having the right mindset. And I'm going to give you an example on the next slide of a sample scenario and how you would apply social intelligence to it. But I'm going to pause for just a minute and say all of you sitting out and listening to this probably are facing a challenge this week in the office, either in marketing or just a business challenge, and you'd like to get an answer to that. And as we go through this next example, think about one of your own challenges and how social intelligence might apply to that as well. So for, for the second piece of advice, we are going to go through just a simple scenario. And for this scenario, we're going to focus on a fictional example, which is someone who is a brand manager at Honda. And in this case, um, there's some great news and then some challenging news. The great news is that Honda has actually placed really well in both J.D. Power and Consumer Reports recently. So that's the great news. The challenging news is that sales and marketing leadership are saying, what are we going to do to get this information out there, how are we going to learn from it, and how are we going to drive showroom traffic? If the person has the right mindset and says, let's go to social intelligence and have social intelligence help us solve this particular business challenge, those people would realize that within a matter of minutes, they would have answers to the following questions. So one of the things that the brand manager could do, first of all, is they could simply apply a custom date range and isolate, let's say, the week or two before these reports came out, and then the week or two right after the reports came out, and they could find out what are the assessments of conversation threads about Honda, and they could actually link those to attributes that are more meaningful, such as maybe value or reliability. And those things were featured in the reports. And more importantly, they could actually compare those notations the couple weeks before or after to how the competitors had fared with those same attributes and the same time frame. And what that would allow this person at Honda to do is to determine, is there a place from a messaging perspective that I have a competitive advantage? Is there something that I want to utilize right now to get a message out about how we fared in these reports and how we actually are going to be better than the competition? something that you could do in a matter of minutes. And Nate actually gave a great example earlier about Microsoft and finding a unique place where people were talking about them. And that's the other beauty of social intelligence is that it's not just people talking about you on Twitter and people talking about you on Facebook, but the fact that many of those conversations are happening on blogs, on forums, and niche media publications that you can all find within your social intelligence platform. And the good news is you can simply go in, figure out where people are talking about your brand, and where they're talking about your brand that really has the most positive impact, and you can pull a report immediately and determine, here are some places where we might be able to use incremental ad spend and do something on the fly. In addition, you have things like A-B testing that you can do. But the last thing on this slide is thinking about things like geo capabilities. And I know that everyone knows uh, if you, for example, happen to be on Facebook and you check in and that drops a pin of your actual location, that's something that geo capabilities that exist in most social listening platforms today. And at Visible, what we realize is that geo capabilities are much more important. And so it's important not to just look for those pin drops, which might be a small percentage but also look for things like where is an author based, based on their IP address, based on author profiles on different social media platforms, and how do you pull all that information together so that you could determine, for example, 
that this Honda brand manager could realize, you know what, we actually have a lot of buzz right now going on in Philadelphia and Atlanta, but there seems to be really a dry spell in Seattle. And how does that impact maybe some quick regional media plan decisions that we could make based on a few minutes of looking at the data? So the, the net result of this second piece of advice is make sure that you understand the power of segmentation that exists within social intelligence. And these are things that you can do in a matter of minutes and something that visible customers have come to rely on. And then the last piece of advice that I have is just simply to think big and realize that you can actually do something sophisticated with social intelligence and it's not that difficult to do. And so I'm actually going to take you back two years ago, and I, I'm choosing this example because not only does it tie into what Nate was talking about earlier today, but it actually shows that something two years ago is something that you can do right now. I, I know that some of you may be dreading the fact that in 2016 we'll have another presidential election, um, but in reality the, the importance of this particular case study is to realize in 2012 how social intelligence was so important in doing some segmentation. In this case, the premise was that the client realized uh, that segmentation down to the, even the district or city level was going to be very important for messaging. And so what they did is they actually went and realized that messaging within Ohio could not all be the same. So they needed to figure out what was the messaging, let's say, in Youngstown, Ohio, versus Toledo, versus Canton, Ohio. All smaller towns in Ohio, but all very different voter segments. And they were able to use social intelligence and very quickly ratchet down and find out which messages would resonate in those areas, do testing with those messages, and then find the winning formulas and basically put a pin on the map to say, when we go into this particular geo, down to even the district level, here's the message that we need to bring to the voters. And I think the importance is just at a high level to realize that with social intelligence, this can all be done in real time. So it's not something where you need to hire you know, a team of social scientists at your side, or you need you know, a million dollar budget. It's something that can be done quickly, cost-effectively, and actually something that can make a big difference. And with that, I'm going to wrap up the slides and turn it back over to Rich. Uh, but before I do that, I want to thank you again, Nate, for joining us today and sharing your insights. And thank all of you who are actually on the call. And we hope that this information will really help you as you go back to your desk and think, how do I leverage social intelligence effectively this week? Rich? Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Nate. Uh, yeah, we did have some questions that came in, and uh, why don't I just throw them out there, and we'll see. Uh, we'll allow both of you to make some comments on them. Um, I think they're broadly applicable. We didn't have any pointed, specific questions of either one of the speakers, but there were some good questions that came in. One of them, just to segue off of your uh, Honda example, uh, Ken. Uh, the question was, is, you know, within the tool, how would you measure the effectiveness of your content both before the Consumer Reports uh, report came out and after to see if there really was an impact? So um, it's just a general, how do we measure communications effectiveness? How do we measure content effectiveness uh, within a social intelligence tool? So maybe Ken, you can start with it. And then, Nate, it would be great to get your two cents on it also. Sure. Well, I, th I think one of the things that I had mentioned in the example is you know, it's really easy to go into, uh, as an example, using the visible platform and actually do uh, date ranges. So what you could do is you could measure you know, two or three weeks before and after an event. And we're going to call the event, let's say, Consumer Reports coming out. And you could look at what is the conversation thread and what are some of the key terms that are being associated with the Honda brand and the positive, negative, or neutral sentiment at that time versus what are some of the uh, messages that are coming out associated with the brand in the two or three weeks after the report. And I think in determining message effectiveness, another thing that you could easily do is go after some of those key messages that you want to test and you could actually place them in different segments or different markets and see how the buzz or reaction is to that. 
And that is something that you can do in a matter of days. Um, it's something that you can actually set up in the system quickly. But I think that's the beauty of social intelligence is that it allows you to get data very quickly and then make decisions on the fly. Great. Thank you. Nate, do you have any thoughts on general measurement of uh, some of these things that you talked about through social media intelligence? Yeah, I think, uh, I think listening can, can certainly play a role in, in how you measure. And, and we really talk to marketers about, about using listening and other tools um, to, uh, in combination to, uh, to, to get to the bottom line on some of that. So if I had a message going out and uh, you know, I'd want to see how far and uh, how fast it spread in social, what the sentiment and the keywords were, as Ken talked about. And I'd also want to add to that uh, data on, uh, on what that did in terms of uh, search volume for my brand and my keywords and uh, traffic to my site from social sites as well. I think the combination of uh, those components can give you some really good insight on, on sort of the, the overall impact of, uh, of uh, a program like that. Great. Thanks. So we have another question here that goes back to the Regain example. Um, and the question is, what could they have done internally to set their, sort, their organization up to really be able to react quickly? Right. So wanted to know, Nate, if maybe you had some thoughts on that. You know, the, the Duncan and the Dark guys, they were able to get something out there really, really quickly. Yeah. And yet the Regain guys weren't able to get anything out there really, really quickly. So assuming that everybody has the same listening capabilities, what type of organizational issues need to be worked out before you can start reacting in near real time and really getting the biggest bang for your buck? Well, it's it's a question of having folks who can uh, who can produce the creative, um, and and that may be uh, uh, creative or or a, a writer. Uh, it may be a uh, um, uh, a graphics person or or uh, or someone who uh, who can do the imagery, uh, or maybe some combination of those um, uh, in the room or at least in contact with someone who can give the sign off. For, for that kind of work, you know, the, the dunk in the dark thing wasn't an accident. Accident, right? They had a um, uh, a, a sort of a, a command center set up uh, so that um, uh, you know they they knew the Super Bowl was going to get people active on social media. Uh, they had the agency and the brand executives in a room monitoring uh, their social listening and social intelligence and uh, and ready to go in terms of uh, creating um, the the post and uh, signing off on it and uh, getting it live. And uh, you know you can't have that at all times, but uh, certainly when there are big events that come around, they're going to create some uh, some some uh, uh, social conversation. It's it's uh, it's worth um, you know, thinking about, uh, even if it's a night or a weekend, having someone uh, ready and available to help out with uh, with opportunities like this. I think the more sustainable long-term approach, though, is is to think about what your process is um, for taking insights from social intelligence and getting them into the hands of people who can act upon them. Uh, and think about how many steps that requires and, and, uh, and how to uh, uh, reduce the number of steps and, uh, and make that process as efficient as possible. Uh, otherwise, you know, you, you've listened to something, identified it, and by the time you're ready to act on it, it's too late. Great. Ken, do you have any thoughts at all? No. I, I think the, the interesting thing, though, is I think back to the Oreo uh, example, I mean, think about the time window that was associated with that. You know, the power went out, and, and I can't remember if that was a 90-minute window or an hour window, but it was a relatively short period of time, whereas the royal wedding was something that, you know, there was coverage for, it seemed like there was coverage for 12 hours, and I'm probably making that up, but it was almost an all-day event. And so I think something like the Royal Wedding, um, big events such as the Super Bowl, things that are planned are certainly things that you should think about as social opportunities. Great. Yeah, one of the first things that pops into my mind is have a conversation with the lawyers first, right? But it's also important to uh, make sure that you've got some of those brand standards, those communication standards, your messaging really well nailed down. and you know, the voice of the, the target market. So it really is something that you can kind of pull from a library and get messaging out there quickly, get everybody bought into that messaging, um, and, and get people more comfortable with the fact that we are in a real world or a real time world now. Um, so thanks a lot for that, for that answer. Uh, another question came in, and uh, Nate, it had something to do with something you mentioned at the very beginning, which is talking to uh, agencies and how people work with agencies. And the question that came in was, are there any questions that we should be asking our agency to really 
see if they know anything about social media listening and social media intelligence. I think reading a little bit into the question, you know, people talk to their agencies, they ask them about what kind of campaigns they've done in the past, and they judge them on their creative content and maybe some executional capabilities. But the questions just aren't uh, front of mind to ask about their analytic capabilities or their intelligence capabilities. Are there any specific questions that should be asked of the agency to see if they really are uh, good in this area? Any thoughts at all on working with the agency? Yeah, I, you know, I'd, I'd suggest you, you have a conversation about what they've successfully done in the past based upon the intelligence gathered from social. Um, it's all well and good for, for them to say, yeah, we, we can do this, but uh, I'd want to see some examples of, of it actually happening. And, and as, you know, as powerful as something like, uh, like the Oreo dunk in the dark thing is, I, I think you should focus less on the hits and more on the ongoing process of pulling social intelligence into your creative and your planning and your execution on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, I think if you do that well uh, every day, then, uh, then you're more likely to have uh, one of those hits happen at some point. So um, you know, uh, ask them what, what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis for existing clients to, to pull social intelligence in, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, ask them as well if, they're, if their creatives and their planners have access to the social data and if they actually use that access because you know, that's, that's what you need if you're going to successfully take advantage of this information. Okay, great. There was a related question that just came in while you were talking, and it said that your initial slide mentioned that most marketers don't have direct access to social, um, social media analytics, that is. And, and I think we just addressed one half of it, which is if you are working with an agency, there can be a, a, a very legitimate way of working with that agency to get some of that social media analytics in. But the question that came in is, you know, let's think about the other way. Let's say we want to do social media analytics within our own organization. What is the primary barrier that you see to being able to do that? So the, the question that came in may be from somebody that's just kind of in a beginner uh, level. They've done some Google alerts in the background and things like that, but now they want to make some more significant investments. You know, maybe some investments that have some commas in them and things like that, right, around social intelligence. But any advice at all on, on how to get that implemented and what may be some of the big organizational barriers that you need to think about um, as you start to get the initiative going, and how yeah, to deal with those barriers. Yeah, I don't think it's like a, I don't think it's a vast conspiracy or anything. I just I think this is this is how uh, customer intelligence and market insights have have long worked. That the, you know that's it's a hard job um, collecting insights and intelligence about our audiences, and and uh, most organizations have entire teams dedicated to doing that, and they're the ones who hold the budget for generating and processing those insights, and it's their job to do that and bring it over to, uh, to uh, the marketers who are maybe doing the creative and the planning and the execution. Um, I, I think that the challenge is just, um, you know, when you look at the survey version of that where, you know, a brand is running a, you know, a, a, an annual or a biannual survey of their audience, well, it's okay to have one team collecting the insights and then processing them and then sort of cherry picking them and handing them to the, the, uh, the marketers. Um, when we're talking about social intelligence, uh, things happen a heck of a lot faster than that. And I think we're just applying the organizational structure that worked for one kind of data and insight to another very different kind of data and, and, and insight. And uh, unfortunately, that old structure doesn't work as well. So I think it really is as simple as, as uh, getting some seat holder access um, into the hands of some folks who are actually doing the creative and the planning. Uh, and it's, you know, again, it's not something that uh, organizations have traditionally done. Um, with uh, with customer insights and and, uh, and market insights, but uh, I think I think in social data and social intelligence in particular, it's time it's time for that to happen. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, and you know, Ken, you mentioned uh, a little bit about it too, and you know how social media is kind of siloed and getting out there and making sure as a social media person, you're talking to people in marketing, uh, product marketing, talking to people in market research, talking to people in uh, you know, even communications and PR and asking them what their big priorities are and then working, the, working that backward into how social can kind of support it. But wanted to know, did you have any other thoughts about how to get the ball rolling and what type of barriers you might have to deal with and how to overcome them? No, I, I guess the only other thing I would mention is that I think today's uh, tools and platforms on the marketplace, and obviously you know, coming from a visible perspective that 
you know, that's, that's what I would endorse. But I think today's tools are very advanced and intuitive, and, and I don't think you need to be a data scientist to be able to use it, and I don't think you need a big budget to be able to adopt one. So I think they're really meant to be in the hands of marketers, uh, communications, personnel, researchers, even customer care. And again, I don't think you need you know, a 500-page manual. I think you can get up and running in a matter of a couple days, and it's really a matter of just applying those business challenges and thinking, now how would I segment this data to help me answer? Great. So we got one last question here that I think is a real good one. It says, what if you don't have a strong brand? How can we best leverage social data and social intelligence when our brand isn't dominant? Um, I think you could say, you know, we don't have a strong brand. You could also say, you know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, B2B is another thing, you know, another area that isn't as highly evolved as B2C. But any thoughts that either one of you might have about how to get the effort going and where the value, the initial value is going to come from when you don't have a strong brand? How do you use social intelligence most effectively then? Well, I think just to jump in, and I, I'm actually going to jump in and then pass the baton to Nate. But Nate, you had a great example with your B2B brand, and I don't have that slide in front of me to see the yep, name. So it's company, called Bongar. Right, it was a smaller company. I'm sure they had a smaller budget, and yet they were really successful in leveraging social. It wasn't, you know, like a Nike or Coca-Cola brand name, but I, I do think social can work wonders in the B2B environment, or you know, when you have a brand that maybe isn't as well known. Yeah, I, I actually don't think that, that having a, a, a small brand or a new brand is any impediment to any of the five ways that we talked about. Uh, you know, UPS um, uh, listened to small business owners for what their biggest problems were. And, uh, and they were listening specifically about uh, problems with UPS, but they could have listened to, you know, if they're an unknown entrant into the market, they could have just listened for small business owners talking about shipping and packaging in general, and it would have helped them develop messaging and content. Uh, in terms of sourcing and refining creative, um, I, you know, I think uh, um, REI is actively collecting um, these posts and encouraging people to, to post images with a hashtag REI1440 project. But uh, even if they weren't doing that, they could go and, uh, and use social listening and intelligence to find people who are posting well about um, outdoor lifestyles and then ask them, do you mind if we you know, sort of promote this? Uh, improving your media plan um, uh, is uh, is one where you know uh, anybody can take advantage of that Twitter option that we talked about. And if you're going to run an ad on TV, just find people who are talking about that TV program online and and uh, and use that for your media plan. Uh, you know, um, Ken just mentioned the Bombgar example and key influencers and and the real time opportunities and threats. Um, even if uh, Regain was a brand new entrant into the market. Um, uh, you know, poking a little bit of fun at uh, at the prince's uh, royal bald spot, uh, I think uh, would have would have gotten some fun attention for them. So, um, obviously, your life is easier if you're a big brand uh, that everyone knows. But uh, I don't think I don't think not having a big established brand is an impediment to any of the five options that we talked about today. Yeah, I agree. I think if you don't have a big brand, then you're thinking about your target market always, and you can always use social intelligence in, in that area. And then you also think about your competitors, right, and listening to what they've got going, kind of the opposite of the UPS thing. It would be the small shippers thinking about what UPS is doing in the same way UPS is listening for communications and messaging about some of their small competitors. So that's great. Well, uh, I think uh, those are all the questions that we had come in. So what we want to do is we really want to uh, wrap this up. Again, thank you, everybody. Uh, for joining us. Our objective is always to make sure that the people that uh, come on to our calls and our webcasts really learn something. Um, identify a couple of things, even if it's just one or two things that you can take back to your desk and start to think about uh, in the coming days. Uh, I think we've, we've met our objective um, in giving you some value through this webcast. Um, and I think this webcast was rich with ideas that uh, hopefully people will be able to take back. So just to wrap things up here really quick, if you do have any questions or other comments uh, and you want to get in touch with Nate directly, at Nate underscore Elliot, uh, or if you want to get together with Ken, uh, ask him a question, you can do uh, Ken Giffen 1, at Ken Giffen 1. Uh, if you do have a question for me, you can always send me an email at rmiller at visibletechnologies.com. Um, take a look at our website if you have any uh, curiosities about what the platform looks like, if you want to learn about case studies 
you want to learn about the latest and greatest in social media, uh, data intelligence, please www.visibletechnologies.com. If you'd like to get a customized demo of the platform that, and how it supports some of the five things that Nate was talking about and also some of the examples that uh, Ken was highlighting, we'd love to get together with you there too. And you can, you can uh, see a request form on our Visible Technology site for that. So thank you very much for the time. Uh, your time is valuable, and we're glad that you decided to spend it with us. Uh, I hope you have a fantastic week. Take care.